Good morning again. Jared, thanks again for that song. That's a song Jared wrote. Very talented young man. Very talented. Um, I was thinking about a lot of things this week, but as I kind of think we're showing up on Sunday and we've just gone through uh, income tax week. Did you guys get through that all okay? Kind of. I know it's a stressful time for a lot of people and people get angry about the taxes we have to pay and how much money we have to give to the government, and so people can be kind of stressed out, and I hope that's kind of gotten through, for, for, you know, you got through that. We had um, something came up on the internet, I guess somebody posted this, and I, I just want to assure you that it's not true. Did you, did you hear this, that they, they posted that Jesus, when he was a baby, was not visited by three wise men. He was actually visited by two wise men and an IRS agent who promptly <laughs> demanded half of the frankincense and myrrh, and it's not true. I, I guarantee you it's not true. Well, we're continuing today in the series, uh, The Life That Jesus Offers. And as we've already kind of spoke about that today is Jesus offers to make us well. And I don't get to preach that often, so I always want to make sure I do a thorough and a good job getting ready. And as soon as I started studying um, about these scriptures, it became very apparent to me that I should really have a good understanding about the, what the Bible says about the origin of sickness and disease. And it, it turns out that there's more than a little bit of scholarly debate about that. And the more I read, I read several hours um, studying this. And the more I read, I, the more that I just kind of came to this conclusion, we could have a whole series of sermons about illness and disease. And um, so I've done my best to condense it down a bit. Um, but... <laughs> Uh, this is about the best I could do. So today's message is going to be uh, just about like an hour or two longer than normal. And uh, if you just uh, kind of get, get you know, comfortable and settle down in there, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll get through it. No, I'm, I am kidding. I, we could really do that. I just wanted to see the look on some of your faces when I told you you were going to miss lunch so that we could talk about sickness. Um, but I do want to talk about that a little bit before we get to the scriptures, because the question is, does God intentionally make people sick? And um, he is sovereign. He's in control of all things. But this is very much like the question, if God is good, why do bad things happen to good people? And really, the, the ultimate answer is, it's because of sin. Romans 3.10 says this, that there is no one righteous, not even one. See, humankind from the beginning has chosen to be disobedient to God. We've gone our own way. And the consequence is that the world and everything in it is broken. And to top it off, our disobedience has seeded our position uh, as the having dominion over creation, and it's given that to our very real enemy, Satan. Now, the Bible doesn't state specifically where illness and disease came from. And I don't claim to know all the answers. And I don't claim to know why God chooses to heal some people and he chooses to not heal others. But I do know this. Sickness and the disease are a symptom of a fallen condition. And our real problem is sin. And that's ultimately what Jesus came to do. He came to pay the price for sin, for our sin, and to bring restoration and renewal. However, when you hear me say Jesus offers to make us well, and you hear the title of that message, there I'm sure a lot of you in this room are very skeptical, and with good reason. Has anyone here ever prayed for someone who was close to you who was sick? And maybe it was just an infection or a small injury, or maybe it was something serious like cancer or heart disease or Alzheimer's. And you prayed in faith, but they didn't get well. They got worse. Maybe they died. Show of hands, has anyone here ever had that experience? Anyone? It's pretty much all of us. It's pretty much all of us. Maybe you were praying for yourself, questioning God, like the character in the drama this morning. And maybe God answered, or he didn't answer you. Or he didn't answer you in the way that you thought. You know, on Palm Sunday, Pastor Craig was uh, talking about Jesus offers to answer our prayers. And he was telling us about Pat Gordon, the senior pastor at a sister church in Napa, who last year was diagnosed with leukemia. 
And as his disease progressed, his doctor sent him home, took him off the medicine, said, you've got a week to live, go be with your family, and sent him home to die. But he didn't die. He was miraculously cured. And there's no medical explanation. He's preaching today in his church. What happened there? And he also talked to us about Emma McKinley, who was so physically twisted and tormented with uh, its reflex sympathetic dystrophy syndrome. And after years and years and years of suffering, she's at her worst point, and out of the blue, she's completely restored. Again, no medical explanation for it. So God still does miraculous healings. And I've never prayed as fervently as when my wife Tammy had cancer, breast cancer, at a very early age. And thankfully, with surgery and radiation and chemotherapy, she's been cancer-free for more than 10 years. And I still pray for her health. But we all know someone, we all know someone right now who's dealing with illness and disease, and some of them very serious. And some of you here are dealing with illness and disease. Mark's gospel is full of stories of Jesus healing people. Uh, I'm going to share some stories from chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 5, chapter 7. But right from the start, in chapter 1, Jesus is doing miracles, and Mark's sharing it. Some of them are big, some not so big. Mark 131, Jesus heals the fever of Simon's mother-in-law. She's got a fever. He heals it. 132, the whole town is gathered, and he heals all kinds of illnesses, and he casts out demons. And Mark closes out the chapter with the story of healing a man with leprosy. And Jesus is described as having been filled with compassion. And that's his motivation. The healing that Jesus works changes the questions that we normally ask when suffering or misfortune strikes. Instead of asking, who did this to me? Or asking, why did this happen? We need to ask, who is this? Who is this who offers forgiveness, who offers healing? and salvation. What does his presence in our lives mean? We can see then that the miracles announce and inaugurate what the future will offer. They are the presence in history of what the promise of history is, a world restored to wholeness and open to God's presence. No meaningful healing can take place without reconciliation with God. Let's pray before we read the scriptures. God, thank you for your word that reveals to us your character, your great love for us, your great power. God, I pray even now that all of us here would see your great compassion for us. And God, we would draw nearer to you. May my words be your words, God, that you would speak to each one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I'm going to start in Mark 2. If you've got your Bible or your flat screen device and you want to read along, I'll read the scripture uh, with you, um, starting in verse 1, chapter 2. When Jesus returned to Capernaum several days later, the news spread quickly that he was back home. Soon the house where he was staying was so packed with visitors that there was no more room, even outside the door. While he was preaching God's word to them, four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. They couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, so they dug a hole through the roof above his head, then lowered the man on his mat right down in front of Jesus. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, My child, your sins are forgiven. But some of the teachers of the religious law were sitting there, and they thought to themselves, What is he saying? This is blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. And Jesus knew immediately what they were thinking. So he asked them, why do you question this in your hearts? Is it easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to stand, pick up your mat, and walk? So I will prove to you that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. And the man jumped up, grabbed his mat, walked out through the stunned onlookers, they were all amazed and praised God, exclaiming, We have never seen anything like this before. Now think about the scene for a minute. Try to put yourself into it, okay? Jesus is preaching God's word, and the place is packed. I mean packed. I mean, wouldn't it be cool if next week when Pastor Craig is preaching God's word, the crowd's so big that you can't even get through the lobby? 
And the only way you could get in is to rappel down from the top of the dome. <laughs> that would be cool. You know, modern, modern archaeology tells us that the roofs at that time would have been a thatched roof. It wouldn't have been all that hard to pull it apart. It wouldn't have been all that hard to repair. But imagine if that was your house, right? <laughs> You're kind of going, wait a minute. What's going on here? It's a crazy situation. But I love how Mark notes that before Jesus does anything about this crazy, absurd situation, that he sees the faith of the friends, and then he acts. But not necessarily in a way the guy on the mat might have thought or might have wanted. When Jesus said, my son, your sins are forgiven, he may have wanted to blurt out, oh, okay, but what I really want is to walk. And that's a reminder to all of us, because so often we think we know what we need. And what we really need is something else. Now, sure, Jesus heals him physically, but he first lets him know that he is healed spiritually, and it's by faith. Jesus also sees into the hearts of the religious teachers, and they have no faith in him, and he calls them on it. But they are right that Jesus is forgiving the sin, and that only God can forgive sins. Last week on my news feed, I saw an article on NPR.org that was titled, If Jesus Never Called Himself God, How Did He Become One? It's an interview with the author Bart Ehrman about his new book called How Jesus Became God, The Exaltation of a Jewish Preacher from Galilee. And Ehrman is quoted as saying this, During his lifetime, Jesus himself didn't call himself God and didn't consider himself God. And none of his disciples had any inkling at all that he was God. Now, that's kind of an interesting statement in light of the passage that we just read. Because while he doesn't state it directly with the words, I am God, it cannot be any clearer that Jesus is claiming to be God, and he's proven the point at the same time. Even his enemies are in agreement about this. Do you also see the lack of compassion in those religious leaders? I mean, nothing. And it's true that sometimes you find no mercy where you might expect to find mercy. This is a true story. In Southern California, there's a convent. And out in front of the convent's a sign. And it says, Absolutely no trespassing. Violators will be prosecuted, prosecuted to the full extent of the law. Signed, the Sisters of Mercy. Now, we can kind of giggle at that, but sometimes in life, we don't encounter mercy where we think we might. And those religious leaders surely had no mercy. Ultimately, though, this act that Jesus does brings about worship. Did you catch that? That it says they were all amazed. And who did they praise? They praised God. Let's go on. Chapter 3, verse 1. Still in Mark. Jesus went into the synagogue again and noticed a man with a deformed hand. Since it was a Sabbath, Jesus' enemies watched him closely. If he healed the man's hand, they planned to accuse him of working on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with the deformed hand, Come, stand in front of everyone. Then he turned to his critics and asked, Does the law permit good deeds on the Sabbath, or is it a day for doing evil? Is this a day to save life or destroy it? But they wouldn't answer him. He looked around at them angrily, and he was deeply saddened by their hard hearts. And he said to the man, hold out your hand. So the man held out his hand, and it was restored. And at once the Pharisees went away and met with the supporters of Herod to plot how to kill Jesus. Now this man's hand, his deformed hand, would have been seen as a punishment that he received for reaching out for something sinful. His condition would have been regarded as proof that his unconfessed sin did not escape the attention of God. But Jesus doesn't flinch, and Jesus doesn't condemn him. Instead, he's righteously indignant at the condition of the religious leaders. Now, hard-heartedness does not mean... Is that me? Val? Okay, did I come loose? Here we go. Hard-heartedness does not mean that these enemies are cold-hearted like we might think. Hard-heartedness in their context had a moral and religious meaning. 
Um, it referred to a lack of understanding, a hardness of mind that made one callous to any spiritual truth and scornfully disobedient to God's will. The withered man with the withered hand, the man with the withered hand is nothing compared to the withered hearts of these religious leaders, the withered souls. And I love the honesty with which Mark writes, because so often we see Jesus portrayed, and we have this image of Jesus as this kind of very meek and mamby pamby kind of guy. But he's ticked. He's mad. And he's sad. He has human emotions. He's angry because these religious leaders who are supposed to represent God show none of God's compassion. And instead, they're more interested in maintaining their rules. Jesus is sad because they're far from God. They know Jesus has done miracles before. They're waiting to see him do it again. And when he does, instead of praising God and worshiping him for his mercy in restoring this man, their evil souls plot to kill Jesus. And they've witnessed a miracle, and yet they still refuse to believe. Hey, Val, why don't we go to this one, and I'll just turn this off. It's getting annoying. They've witnessed a miracle, and yet they still refuse to believe. I mean, how many miracles do you need to see? We talked about that last week. How can doubt and skepticism and disbelief continue? And in some ways, we can all be blind and skeptical, can't we? Agreed? It's like the story, there's a man, he has a dog, he's taking the dog for a walk on the beach, and he's really proud of the trick that he's taught his dog. And in a little while, he comes across a second man, and he says, hey, let me show you what my dog can do. And he bends over, he picks up a piece of driftwood, and he throws it out in the ocean. And the dog runs after the driftwood, running on the waves, grabs the wood, and runs back. The second guy kind of shakes his head a little bit. And the first guy goes, yeah. He goes, I'll show you again. So he does it two more times. After the third time, the first man says, did you notice anything? And the second guy says, yeah, your dog can't swim, can he? <laughs> That's kind of funny, but it makes me think there's sometimes that we can be blind to what God is doing right before our very eyes. He's doing something, and we just don't see it. Let's look at another healing. This is Mark chapter 5, verse, starting in verse 25. A woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding. She had suffered a great deal from many doctors, and over the years had spent everything she had to pay them. But she had gotten no better. In fact, she had gotten worse. She had heard about Jesus, so she came up behind him through the crowd and touched his robe. For she thought to herself, if I can just touch his robe, I will be healed. Immediately the bleeding stopped, and she could feel in her body that she had been healed of her terrible condition. Jesus realized at once that the healing power had gone out from him, so he turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched my robe? His disciples said to him, Look at this crowd pressing around you. How can you ask who touched me? But he kept on looking around to see who had done it. Then the frightened woman, trembling at the realization of what had happened to her, came and fell to her knees in front of him and told him what she had done. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Your suffering is over. And we too can be afraid to come to Jesus and ask him to make us well. And how come it seems like we need to be in a desperate situation like this woman was before we turn to God? I mean, you know what I mean? Where is our faith in the day-to-day -day issues we face? Do we reach out to God? Do we act in faith? Or do we sit and wait? Do we take action? Or do we sit back? There was a nun who was on a missions trip to the Native Americans in the southwestern United States. And she was so excited, she was driving along did not notice that her car was nearly on empty, or was on empty, passes a gas station, about a mile past the gas station, the car runs out of gas. She has to walk back a mile in the desert to the gas station. She gets there. While sympathetic, the attendant had no can to give her for the gas. But he wanted to help. So he said, hey, I'm going to go look in this old storage shed and see if there's anything in there that we can use as a container. 
The only thing he could find was this old metal bedpan. You know, the stainless steel kind, about yay big. It was the only thing they could use, so filled it up with gas, and she carefully walked the mile back, trying not to spill it. And as she gets to the car and begins to start to fill the car, a semi-truck comes, and the guy stops and looks over and sees the nun with the bedpan pouring it into the car. And the truck driver leans over and says, Sister, I wish I had your faith. We want to have the faith. I want to have the faith of the bleeding woman. But I don't want to be desperate before I reach out for God. You know, again, the result is worship. The woman realizes the goodness of God. And what does she do? She falls down trembling at Jesus' feet. And I just wish we would all bow down before the amazing grace of our Lord. Last one, Mark 7, starting verse 31. Jesus left Tyre and went up to Sidon before going back to the Sea of Galilee and the region of the Ten Towns. A deaf man with a speech impediment was brought to him, and the people begged Jesus to lay his hands on the man to heal him. Jesus led him away from the crowd so they could be alone. He put his fingers into the man's ears, and then spitting on his own fingers, he touched the man's tongue. Looking up to heaven, he sighed and said, Ephatha which means be opened. Instantly, the man could hear perfectly and his tongue was freed so he could speak plainly. Jesus told the crowd not to tell anyone, but the more he told them not to, the more they spread the news. Isn't it kind of interesting, these stories that Mark tells us that how the woman kind of just reaches out and almost accidentally gets healed. And then Jesus takes this man and he's sticking his fingers in his ears and he's licking his spit. And it's kind of weird, isn't it? It's kind of, it's kind of strange. I mean, I don't know exactly why he's doing what he's doing. It just shows you that God has his own ways of doing things in different situations. And it never is exactly how we might think it might go. What are a few things that we notice? In these passages and what might God want to use here to change us one of the things that's very evident to me and should be evident to all of us is that Jesus uses physical healing to teach larger or deeper lessons because this is an interesting interesting fact you might not have thought of all these people that Jesus healed they died eventually they died just like us they had a physical death at some point he healed them for a time, but they all died. See, the main problem in a person's life is never his suffering. It's his sin. And I'm not just talking about the bad things that we do, like lying, lust, cheating on your income taxes last week. I hope none of you did that. <laughs> Whatever. It's ignoring God. Ignoring God in the world that he made and rebelling against him by living without any reference to him. Do you know what I mean by that? Without any reference to him, like he's not even involved. In, a, in essence saying, I will decide exactly how to live my life. And Jesus says that's our main problem. We build our lives, our identities on something other than him. And we think, well, if I just had that thing, that house, that relationship, that career, that money, then I would be happy and content. But the truth is that when we get the things we think we want and they don't fulfill us the way we thought they would, then we're less happy and less content. Jesus wants to heal our discontent. He wants us to know that he alone is enough. And if Jesus is the model for our ministry to others, and he is, we see one who announces the forgiveness of sin and the chance of reconciliation with God, which brings in its wake healing. We need to proclaim in words and deed this offer of forgiveness. When the sick came to Jesus, he did not spurn them, but he announced God's forgiveness and manifested God's love. He drove away the handmaidens of illness, hopelessness, guilt, despair. This healing that Jesus offers demands that we tell people. 
Did you catch that in that last story? How he told them, don't, don't tell. But they had to. They couldn't help it. It's too good. We can't keep it to ourselves. Ultimately, Jesus heals us so that we can be instruments of healing. But our spiritual hard hearts can sometimes stop us from doing what God wants us to do. In 2011, in Alameda, not far from here, they had to change their policies after some first responders stood by and watched a man drown in, in San Francisco Bay. The first responders didn't venture out into the muddy waters of the bay, even as the man started treading water and then eventually went under. According to the fire chief, two things prevented the authorities from taking action. First, because it was a crime scene, the man was trying to commit suicide, the police felt that going into the water initially might not be the best idea because they were unsure if this individual was armed. Second, the chief said, there was a policy in place that pretty much stopped our people from entering the water. Local officials also noted that due to a lack of funding, firefighters had no one properly trained to go into the water. The Alameda police chief was also quoted to say, it's muddy out there. We don't want the police officers sinking. We don't want them in distress. So the first responders watched a man who had decided to commit suicide, but apparently changed his mind. And then as they watched, he began to tread water their interpretation of the law would not allow them to save the man. Eventually, his body became so tired, he went under and he drowned. Their policies were changed a few days after this horrifying incident. But it begs the question of us. What policies do we need to change in our own hearts and in our minds to better follow Christ and do his will? What policies do we have that hold us back from reaching out? And a reminder that sin is not just doing something wrong. It's just as much and maybe more often not doing something good that we know we should do. So I ask this. Have we trained ourselves to be ready to rescue the dying? And I'm not talking about the physically dying. I'm talking about the dying people all around us every day that have never tasted the forgiveness that Jesus offers, who don't know his amazing grace, who don't know that he loves them so much, and he offers to make them well forever. I have a note in my Bible in the book of Romans, and I was reading this week, and I saw this little note. It just says, the breathless wonder of forgiveness. The funny thing is, I don't remember why I wrote that there. I don't know where it came from. It's just beautiful to me. The breathless wonder of forgiveness. It's a great reminder to me to never take forgiveness for granted. And that's my prayer today, that we would all let Jesus heal us of our discontent. And that we would let him use us as instruments of healing for others. I'm going to invite the band to come back up and they're going to lead us in one more song. And as they do, I invite you to stand with me and let's pray together. God, again, I thank you for your word. Thank you that you are a God of compassion, a God who hears us and a God who heals us. And God, we don't understand why sometimes you might choose to physically heal one and and not the other. But God, we know that you have your purposes. God, we know that ultimately you want to heal us of that which is most important. And that's our sin, our disobedience to you. God, thank you that Jesus made a way for that. I pray for each one here. God, I pray for anyone who's suffering from any illness. God, that you would bring physical healing. I pray that you would reach out, help us to reach out to one another in compassion to help uh, those of us who are debilitated, who are suffering. God, that our hearts would be like yours, that we would have that compassion. And God, beyond that, I pray that you would use us as instruments of your healing, that we would be healed by you so that we can heal others. For God, we know that you love the people all around us, and they need to know your great forgiveness. So God, help us as we go forward this week and for the rest of our lives, God, that we would be a compassionate 
healed people ready to heal others. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen.